the harvest. The harvest truly is plentiful, Jesus would say to his apostles, to his disciples. You know, I think about in, in our country, we hear a lot, probably especially in election cycles, we hear a lot talked about when it comes to employment and unemployment especially, and we talk about the unemployment rate. And just out of curiosity, I, I went back and, and did some searching, a little bit of uh, look up a little bit of history, thinking about, of course, uh, even what hit our country in the uh, 1930s, the Great Depression. And, and I was just curious at the, the unemployment rate to try to figure out what, if, if somebody had come up with a specific number for that. And it was somewhere around 25%. 25%. One quarter of our nation's workforce was out of work. Couldn't get work. In fact, because the economy had not just declined, but plummeted. And, and I think about those numbers and it reminds me, and that's it, during that time frame, that's somewhere around 15 million people. And, and not that I'm an accounting type of guy, I don't like math, but I do like numbers in some ways. <laughs> that may be the preacher in me or something, but... When I think about numbers and that, what does that mean? Well, how does that translate? Well, that was a quarter of the population of our country. 25%. And I wonder, because sometimes, you know, we hear, we hear phrases about that 20%. Now, when it relates to the church, we hear phrases like 20% of the congregation is doing 80% of the work. You've probably heard that before, right? I don't know where preachers have gotten their numbers exactly, but maybe, that's, maybe they've sat down and actually figured that out. I haven't spent time to do that. But that's an interesting thought. But what it translates to me is not just that only 20% are doing 80% of the work, but rather that there's 20% of work still lacking. Now think about it from that standpoint. That there's 20% of the work that needs to get done that's not getting done in the Lord's church. And so I think that there is a greater problem, and certainly our country is doing fairly well when it comes to the uh, employment of its nation's workforce. But there's a greater problem with unemployment that goes far beyond this country, and that is in the Lord's church. And so let's draw our attention then to Matthew chapter 9, and read again Matthew 9, verse 36 through 38. And then we'll also add to that John 4, 35 to 38. Speaking of Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them or for them because they were weary. Some translation says they were fainted. They were weary to the point of fainting. And in fact, they were scattered as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, now in the midst of all that, looking out over the crowd that he could see, moving with compassion, because he says they're scattered, they have no, she they have no shepherd to guide them, so they're just out there, they're just scattered about, and they're weary. They're weary. They're tired. They're to the point of fainting, to the point of passing out. And he says this to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Remember, it is his harvest that we're talking about. And remember also then that in the midst of all of that, Jesus looked at that and he said, This is an opportunity. This is opportunity. This is not just to be seen as, as a dark time, as, a, as there's nothing that we can possibly do about this, and so we're just going to sit down and do nothing. No, he said, look, the harvest truly is plentiful. There's much to do. There's work on every hand sometimes we'll sing. That's the idea. He says the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You see, this could be the sermon could be titled that. The laborers are few. Rather than the harvest is plentiful. 
I, I wanted to put a, a positive spin on it. I want us to see it in that light. But I want us to also understand the reality that we also face in the Lord's church. John chapter 4. It's recorded this way. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields for they are ready, already says white, for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying is true, one sows, another reaps. And I sent you, he says, to reap for which you have, that for which you have not labored. And others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And I see a, a second part to this as well would be the fact that laborers together, working together, Someone in the past may have been laboring and working, maybe planting seed with an individual in an individual's heart and, 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 and working with them. Someone else comes along and waters that seed, right? And God gives the increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And Paul would talk about that as well, talking about laboring after others have, have come about and, and done some other works. And he said, so look, this is, this is it. This is what it boils down to. In the midst of all of this, the harvest is plentiful, number one. The laborers are few. There's the reality, number two. But we do this work together, number three. And number four, we need to pray. That's our lesson for this morning. So let's think about number one, the abundance of the harvest. The abundance of the harvest. To the extent the harvest can be seen with our own eyes, it might be difficult to see that there is an abundance. It might be difficult to see that it is, in fact, plentiful. But when we look with the eyes of Jesus, we will see things a little differently. We will see, as did Jesus, that in those dark and gloomy and, and bleak times when they were fainting, when they were scattered as sheep having no shepherd, He says the harvest truly is abundant. It's plentiful. And so if we think about this from the eyes of Jesus, see this with the eyes of Jesus, and I think about then, there is a great diversity of folks from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds, from all parts of the world. Not all who live here in Maryville and Blount County were certainly born here in Blount County. You know that. Those who are uh, from this area, you've seen really probably an explosion of the population in this area. And again, looking back in the history of Blount County, that seems to be the case as the numbers tell the story. But in, those, in that great diversity of people that are in this county, that are in our town, they have been some uprooted from their family ties. Some have been brought here because of jobs. Some have settled here and they, again, uprooted from family ties and maybe even from good spiritual influences. Here they are, they're removed from those former environments with no, nothing to, to bind them as a community. Now they may get involved in certainly other things. There are community activities, but not necessarily spiritual community activities. Removed from those former environments with no, nothing to bind them together. Even sometimes within their own neighborhoods, people feel alone. People look out and they see their neighbors and they, they want nothing to do with them, seemingly have nothing to do with them, have nothing in common, but maybe the simple fact that they're all alone. Or maybe that they are all souls should give us some common ground with which to work. Many are looking for something better. Many are looking for some, something to encourage them. There, there has to be something better, right, in this life. Something to cling to. Something to give purpose to uh, for their lives. And then we have the religious world. I would say fumbling at best. Making a mess of things in the wilderness of denominationalism. And, and, and often calls people that just want to give up. They're discouraged. They want to faint. They're weary from it all. 
Maybe they've been seeking for some time. Maybe they've been searching for some time. That chaos has not been caused by God. It's been caused by Satan. And man in particular, as a tool of Satan, to confuse, to divide, and to cause people to lose heart. But in that, there is still opportunity where many will completely give up and many are still searching and many become disgruntled and, uh, with religion in general and God in particular, many people. Many young families trying to make a go of it without, without any spiritual barometer to keep them on track. Many people facing battles of depression, sickness, disease, loneliness, as I mentioned a moment ago. And some people that are just in pain and hurting. That's the picture that Jesus gave His disciples. He said, this is a weary people. They're fainting. And they're like sheep having no shepherd. They're just scattered about. That's what He was describing. And when we look around, we can see the very same thing. Especially when we look with the eyes of Jesus. And we might look at that situation and say, well, they won't listen. They don't want to hear what we have to say. But again, if we are looking with the eyes of Jesus, then that means we're going to be looking with eyes that are compassionate, loving, caring, concerned. He saw with compassion, verse 36, an opportunity because those people were facing battles, because they were sick, because they were lonely, because they were hurting. And we too should see that as an opportunity. And it gives us a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to see beyond because eyes, the eyes of Jesus see beyond race and religion and class. And I'm of the opinion that with all the, the racial tension in the world today and with the class warfare that's going on in politics today, in this country in particular, the only way to overcome any of it is through Jesus Christ. The only way that we can be truly united is in Christ then all of those things wash away and wash to the side. And we see no more of that, but we see with the eyes of Jesus, we see souls. Brother Eric Owens preached a lesson years ago at Polishing the Pulpit that I probably will never get out of my mind. And it was simply entitled, People Need Jesus. <laughs> People Need Jesus. All people need Jesus. And so we need to be able to see the abundance of the harvest. And we can do so when we look with the eyes of Jesus. Here's the reality. We might as well face the facts that the laborers are few. In the midst of the world's crisis, the church of our Lord faced probably the most colossal opportunities more so maybe than we've ever seen even today. It was brand new. In either a Jewish world or a Grecian world, which meant a pagan world or someone holding on to the old system. And so what Christ introduced, seeing the abundance. And I think that this also goes to the fact that the Apostle Paul would make the statement that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, made under the law, living under the law Himself. The fullness of time. Why? Because of the abundance of the harvest. It was time. But what about us today? Do we not see that as opportunity? And sometimes the discouragement is that that old phrase, 20% doing 80% of the work and then realizing that still can't get all the work done. And so we must examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves as 
laborers. We see the scarcity of the laborers. The laborers are few. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 reminds us to examine ourselves. And so I have to ask, well, what about in the matter of church attendance? How is my attendance? Say, well, I'm here this morning. <laughs> good, good. Will you be here this evening? Will you be here at other opportunities when the church assembles together? So I, I know this, this sounds like the preacher's meddling again, right? <laughs> He's getting in my business. No, I'm asking us to look within. I, I'm asking us to search. Because church attendance is not necessarily the problem, it's a symptom of a problem, of a heart problem. Which also leads to the fact that the laborers are few. If you study the acts of worship in the New Testament, one thing that seems to stand out to me is this idea. You, you will see a constant theme. There is an each other theme, a together theme, an assembling type of theme. A coming together of the people of God, of those who truly love Him, those whom He has called, and those who have called upon Him as we studied in our Bible class this morning. And so when you think about worship, you think about one another, each other, and a togetherness, and a unity that helps us to grow stronger. It is spiritually uplifting when we come together for worship. And certainly, we have been commanded to do so. We could look at Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. But I would ask us to simply think about from the heart, Matthew 6, 33. Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So what about the matter of church attendance? What about the matter of... Bible study. Bible study itself. You think about not just studying on our own, but coming to Bible study. What, what a better way to do that? When, when brethren are studying on their own as they should on a daily basis, we're opening God's Word and we're communing with God in that way. We're, we're praying and, and we're listening to what He has to say through His Word on a daily basis and then come together in Bible study with your brethren Entirely too many members of the church remain unemployed in this part of the church's work. And it is a work of the church. In Bible school, we study God's Word. We study it in its context. And as teachers, we help the students to see the application. But it's up to each individual in the class to make the application. But so many times, that's really where the growth of the church is going to be seen. Both spiritually and numerically is in Bible study. Not necessarily in worship. Worship, attending worship is going to take care of itself. Because there again, we should see it as a golden opportunity to study God's Word. What about personal evangelism? Obviously, when we're talking about the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few, and pray that the Lord of harvest will send forth labors into His harvest. We're talking about evangelism. We're talking about reaching souls. It's the marching order of the church to, to go and to preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. And yet, again, so few today in the church ever talk about the gospel to others. Maybe let's take a simple test this morning. Ask yourself, who have I talked to or told about Christ this week? Let's just say this week. Because I might, I might look for those opportunities. I might be looking for opportunities, but it just didn't come about the way that I, I thought they would. But was I attempting to teach someone about Christ 
this week. If not, why not? And maybe it's an area that I need to work on. I know there's several groups that get together, have Bible studies together because they want to grow. And so the last two points really kind of work off of each other, Bible study and personal evangelism. Because to evangelize, I have to be prepared. I have to be ready to go out. And there are those who get together and do just that. I know Brother Lee teaches a, I'm not sure what he calls it, I call it a foundations of faith type of class. I believe every other Tuesday night. It's why we have classes upcoming like the Fishers of Men class where we talk about the, the how, what, when, why, and, and where even about person-to-person evangelism or we can train ourselves to do just this kind of work. Here's a shameless plug. There's still room available. Go sign up after services. But consider this. In the secular world, if we want to, to get something done, typically what happens is we create a new organization to do it. Or we, we create a, a committee to, to, to go and get this done, at the very least. Beautiful thing is the church of our Lord, it's already in place. I want you to look at a passage with me in Ephesians chapter 4. And I want you to see it in this light. Ephesians 4, thinking about... Personal evangelism, thinking about the work of the church. Ephesians 4. <clears throat> Let's begin at verse 11. He, <clears throat> he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Verse 12 tells us why. For the equipping of the saints for the work of of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ how long? till we all come to the unity of faith now the reason that we need to know how long he was talking about spiritual gifts in the previous context still he's talking about that talking about being able to accomplish but we have what those spiritual gifts were meant to bring about and that's the revealed completed New Covenant, New Testament, we have that before us. And so it serves in that same purpose. To do what? To help us in the work of the ministry. To help us in the edifying of the body of Christ. To help us to be growing, essentially. That's what he says. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, the trickery of men, the cunning craftiness uh, of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in himself and into him who who is the head, rather, Christ, from whom the whole body, watch this, joined and knit together. Did you pick up on that? Together. Working together by what every joint supplies according to the effectual working by which every part does its share, causes growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. You see, the church of our Lord is already sufficiently organized to be able to accomplish the will of the Lord, to be able to accomplish spreading the truth in love. What about in matters of giving? Jesus said, very simply, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20, verse 35, we're reminded of that. But I want you to understand, this was completely a a radical philosophy being introduced in the first century, and probably even in the 21st century as well. Because we too live in a me-saturated society. It's about me, 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 and I, 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 and and therefore it's, it's mine. That's not what we learn. This we have been blessed with from God. It's His. And we're to be good stewards of what He has blessed us with. And I believe again, few in the Lord's church take part in this work as well. Each Christian though has employment in giving as God has prospered, 1 Corinthians 16 too. But how many are really fair in their giving? 
We're taught to give every man according as he purposes in his heart. So it's up to you to make up your mind what you're going to give as God has prospered. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. What about in the matter of benevolence? You see, we could probably just continue on and on in this, down this road. What about benevolence? This is a fundamental part of the Christian religion, isn't it? James 1.27 talks about pure religion, undefiled before God, and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, Whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Rhetorically, the answer is no, it doesn't. It doesn't. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And so that work needs to be seen. Benevolent type of work. The problem of the poor is a permanent one, evidently. Jesus made the statement, you will have the poor with you always. So there's always going to be a need, certainly then for benevolence. How, how are you employed in the work of benevolence? You see, the work of benevolence is often done individually. Sometimes it's the case that as a Christian, we see a need and we go and help and take care of it immediately. Sometimes the need's bigger than what we can handle, and so the church has an opportunity to help collectively, together, because we have assembled together, because we consider one another in those deeds and in the work that we're doing. Benevolence. What about the matter then of daily Christian living? You see, when we think about the labors are few, we examine ourselves and say, okay, well, how is it that I'm living my life? Because Jesus taught that I'm the light of the world. My influence means something. I affect someone. I influence someone around me, whether good or bad, in my life. And so I have to examine myself in this way in my daily Christian living. Luke recorded that that which Jesus began to do and to teach. There was something about what He was doing. Something that others could see in His life. Acts 1 and verse 1. So when we do our religion, then people will be interested in hearing what we have to say and teach. It's just that important. Living faithful Christian life. Living in a manner of life that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. Philippians 1 and verse 27. We are living letters known and read of all men. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2. And so the church is more than just a preaching station, if you will. It's more than just a mouth for Christ. While we should be a mouth, we're also to be hands and feet who will do the work of Christ as well. The last thought is this. The laborer is worthy of his wages. And that means that we'll be re rewarded ultimately, again, for all of our work good or bad, <laughs> lacking or not, there's going to be a wage that's going to be paid. And he says in Luke 10, verse 7, that the laborer is worthy of his hire, worthy of his wages. And so we have to be reminded, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our work is not in vain. It's not useless. Matthew 10, 42, And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. There's a reward that is coming. And just as there are few laborers, it is likely then the case that there will be few that will be rewarded certainly in a good way. And we're reminded of that in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, wides the gate, and broads the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way, he says, that leads to life. And there are few that go in by it. 
our reward will be measured by our ability to work. Our question then for each of us. Are you unemployed in the work of the church? Or are you fully employed? Fully given yourself to the work? And I mentioned this as a last thought. We need to be praying. We need to be praying for the work. Praying for the harvest. According to Matthew 9 and verse 38. Therefore pray the Lord of harvest that He will send out laborers into His harvest. No church is worthy of the name of Christ who is not a praying church. And so my question is, are we praying? Are we praying for the church here at Eastside? Are we praying for our elders, for our deacons, for our preacher, for each member, for evangelism, for giving, for worship, for our daily living, for our light and opportunity in this community? Are we praying And if we're praying, then are we doing? That's the question for us to answer this morning. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Maybe this morning as you contemplate these things and you think about what our Lord has called us to do, to go and to preach that saving message. What is that message? That Jesus truly died for our sins. He died for me. He died for you. He died for the whole world. He shed His blood that we might have an eternity in heaven. Maybe this morning, upon realizing that good news, the good news that He died for our sins, He died so that we do not have to carry that burden of sin any longer, but that we can be forgiven. And He simply says, Believe me. Believe in me, John 8, 24. Confess me before men. I'll confess you before my Father in heaven, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Repent of sin, Acts 17, 31. And be baptized to wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, Acts 22 and verse 16. Maybe you've taken those steps. And this lesson is really for us. Those who have, are we faithfully living for Christ. And if we can help or encourage you this morning, if you have a need, come to the front while we stand and while we sing.